In 1924, almost seven decades before the creation of the DC Comics character of the same name, the first story was published featuring Agatha Christie's little-known recurring character, Harley Quinn, a reference to Harlequin of the theater form Commedia dell'arte. He appears in several murder mysteries, but unlike other Christie characters, he is not what one would call a sleuth. Though never explicitly stated, Harley Quinn is implied to be some manner of supernatural or otherworldly being. Every time he appears, it's described like this. Framed in the doorway stood a man's figure, tall and slender. He appeared by some curious effect of the stained glass above the door to be dressed in every color of the rainbow. Mr. Quinn turns up in certain places at certain times and says and does certain things that bring about the revelation of truth. The implication is that, at least where murder cases are concerned, he already knows the solution but for whatever reason, he can't or won't get directly involved. Like a force of nature, he guides the attention of mortals to the important details, and helps them to see patterns they hadn't seen before. I say mortals, but in the case of these stories, it's the same person every time. Mr. Satterthwaite, whose first name is never mentioned, is a socialite who appears in every Harley Quinn story. He thinks of himself as a looker-on in life, someone who is separate from those to whom things happen, or those who make things happen. Whenever Mr. Quinn appears, however, Mr. Satterthwaite finds himself becoming a doer, a person who brings about change. Some people refer to Mr. Satterthwaite as the catalyst by which Mr. Quinn acts upon the world, though personally I see it the other way around. The two of them feature in 14 short stories. Twelve of them can be found in The Mysterious Mr. Quinn, published in 1930. The other two were published much later in other short story collections. One of them, I suspect, because it shares its solution with a popular Miss Marple novel. The other because it was written decades later than the rest. Out of all of these, the only one to receive a film adaptation is the first story, The Coming of Mr. Quinn. I'm speaking of the very first Agatha Christie film adaptation, the 1928 silent film, The Passing of Mr. Quinn. Sadly, this is a lost film, but by all accounts, as an adaptation, it was loose in the extreme. Among the many changes they made, they turned Mr. Quinn into a villain. That's absurd! How could anyone ever conceive of Harley Quinn being... Oh. This film marks the only ever on-screen appearance of Mr. Quinn, but that's one more than poor Mr. Satterthwaite ever got. However, he did guest star in two Poirot stories, so although we can't discuss a Harley Quinn adaptation, we can discuss an adaptation of a story that was Harley Quinn adjacent. Satterthwaite appears briefly in the short story Dead Man's Mirror. The adaptation leaves him out, but is otherwise fantastic. In the novel Three-Act Tragedy, Satterthwaite and Poirot both investigate the mystery. This book has two TV adaptations, starring Peter Ustinov and David Suchet, respectively. I'd planned to focus just on the Ustinov, but a lot of subscribers have asked me to cover the Suchet as well, so I guess I'm doing both. Incidentally, in an earlier video, I stated that Satterthwaite functions as Dr. Watson to Poirot's Sherlock Holmes, but upon rereading this book, I discovered that really isn't the case, so my bad. Three-Act Tragedy also titled Murder in Three Acts, was published in 1934. It was also the first Poirot novel I ever read. It's unusual in that it begins with what appears to be a short set of program notes, including Directed by Sir Charles Cartwright and Illumination by Hercule Poirot. Mr. Satterthwaite and Hercule Poirot both attend a dinner party given by retired stage actor Sir Charles Cartwright. The other guests include Dr. Bartholomew Strange, a Harley Street nerve specialist, Hermione Lytton Gore, Charles's romantic interest, who goes by the nickname Egg, Hermione's mother Mary, journalist Oliver Manders, Reverend Babington and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Dakers, the actress Angela Sutcliffe, the playwright Muriel Wills, a.k.a. Anthony Astor, and Miss Milray, Charles's housekeeper. The party has barely started when Reverend Babington suddenly dies after drinking a cocktail. Charles and Egg suggest it might have been murder, but Dr. Strange... whoops... Wrong one. Dr. Strange and Mr. Satterthwaite are convinced it was natural causes. Poirot agrees the circumstances of the death are odd, but finds murder to be unlikely. No poison is found in the cocktail glass. The first chunk of the story focuses less on the murder and more on the drama unfolding between Charles, Egg, and Oliver Manders, whom Satterthwaite mistakenly assumes is Egg's object of affection. Apparently Charles made the same assumption, for he up and moves to Monte Carlo. 
It's interesting to view Charles through Satterthwaite's eyes. It's always in the context of an actor choosing different roles or making exit lines. Some weeks later, Satterthwaite is shocked to learn that Dr. Strange has died in circumstances almost identical to that of Reverend Babington. Let's start with the Suchet adaptation. It follows the book pretty closely, with Poirot largely filling in for Mr. Satterthwaite. Angela Sutcliffe is left out. Charles's house, Crow's Nest, is the show's favorite house that they've used in 600 episodes. Charles calls Poirot one of his best friends, putting them on more intimate terms. In the book, Egg kisses Oliver in an attempt to arouse jealousy in Charles so he'll finally make a move, but it's never confirmed whether he ever even saw the kiss. In the film, he definitely sees it, giving context to the line, I wish to God I'd never come to the wretched place. The Ustinov version moves the time period to 1986, the year in which it was made, and moves the location, at the start, to Acapulco. Charles Cartwright is played by Tony Curtis, and other actors are recognizable if you watch a lot of 80s TV. The film adds Captain Hastings, played by Jonathan Cecil. I know I've been spoiled by Hugh Fraser, but I cannot stand this version of Hastings. He's the only British character, which means all of the other characters from the book, apart from Poirot, have had their nationality changed. Even some names, too. Who is the young gentleman? Ricardo Montoya, Monsieur Poirot. Wait, wait, did he say... Ricardo Montoya, Monsieur Poirot. Ricardo Montoya. Montoya. Oh, Ricardo, not... Okay, never mind. Relax, everyone. Why do so many 80s TV movies start with a long car ride? Can the screenwriter think of no other way to provide exposition? That said, there's some really good dialogue interspersed with the bad. Well, my logic tells me it's not murder, but my instinct keeps tapping me on the shoulder. I liked that Poirot secretly kept hold of the cocktail glass before the others got washed, so it could be tested for poison. Hastings, don't drop it. The energy in this version is less mellow than in the Suchet, yet the pace feels slower. I think this is because, while the book focuses on the characters, specifically the romance between Charles and Egg, this film shifts the focus onto Poirot. There's a whole subplot about him trying to write his memoirs. It's so long before the romance receives any attention that it seems to come out of nowhere. I was afraid this would happen. So was I. Meanwhile, Angela comes on to Charles hard and serves as competition for Egg. For this reason, Angela's the only character you really remember. The rest are all a blur, though Miss Milray stands out briefly when she gives off Miss Packard vibes. Betty and Cynthia Dayton, the Reverend and Mrs. Babington. One other thing. This adaptation leaves out what I consider an interesting layer of Egg's character. In the book, she was in love with the Babington's son, Robin, who was killed years ago. This is what motivates her to solve the Reverend's murder. Or so she says. A while back, I said that three-act tragedy doesn't count as an Agatha Christie crossover. Well, I probably should have read the book a second time before saying that, rather than trusting my memory from age 14. The farther I got in the reread, the more I realized this is the only real Agatha Christie crossover. Cards on the Table might involve characters from different stories joining forces, but this is the only book where two protagonists from different series end up working together. Poirot, Satterthwaite, and Charles all happen to be in Monte Carlo when they read about the death of Doctor Strange. When I first read this, I expected the three of them to team up. Imagine my surprise when Charles and Satterthwaite leave Poirot behind! Seven of the guests at Charles's party were also present when Strange died. Charles and Satterthwaite agree that Strange must have discovered who killed Babington, and so the killer silenced him. The police suspect Ellis, Strange's butler, who mysteriously vanished following the murder, but Charles finds a hidden letter showing that Ellis blackmailed the murderer. Ellis must have either been paid off or killed off. Satterthwaite tends to feel snubbed whenever Charles doesn't defer to him as the more experienced, albeit amateur, investigator. But when Egg joins the team, he mostly graciously steps back so the two lovers can have their happy ending. It takes a while, but they finally express their feelings, and in true Agatha Christie fashion, promptly become engaged. Prematurity aside, there's an unsettling implication that Egg might have killed Doctor Strange just to get Charles to come back to her. 
When Poirot finally steps back into the story, we, the reader, of course, are cheering, but the investigators have mixed reactions. Charles doubts Poirot is much of a detective, and Egg is dead set against him joining their team. Satterthwaite is initially frustrated with Poirot based on a mistaken impression that Poirot habitually misinterprets people's behavior, but at this point he gradually begins to see that Poirot is actually quite shrewd. For one thing, Poirot discerns that Oliver's motorbike accident that brought him to the scene of Strange's death was actually staged. Oliver claims Strange himself asked him to stage it, though no one believes Strange would ever do such a thing. Something else out of character for Strange was that on the fatal night he made a joke to his butler. The joke came just after Ellis reported a telephone call regarding one of his patients, Mrs. de Rushbridger. Charles concludes that she must have something to do with the crime, but if she does, she can't tell them anything as she's unable to speak. Poirot gives a party and invites all the suspects. According to formula, this is when he should give the solution, but suddenly Charles drops dead. But it's a hoax. Poirot wanted to demonstrate how someone could have switched out the poison glass during the commotion. That's why neither of the glasses tested by the police contained any poison. He also advises the guests to come forward if they know anything, lest the killer strike again. Poirot receives a telegram from Mrs. de Rushbridger. Apparently she can communicate after all. She says she has information for them, but before they can reach her, she receives a box of chocolates and is poisoned. On top of that, the playwright, Miss Wills, disappears. Poirot says he knows who the murderer is, but can't figure out why Babington was murdered. If only Dr. Strange had been murdered first. Because at least we would have a motive. The doctor has many professional secrets. Apart from the fact that Poirot is never absent from the case, the Suchet film is accurate overall. But I'd like to point out a few things. In the book, in Monte Carlo, Poirot sees some kids on vacation who are bored, and realizes as a retiree, he's one of them, which is what motivates him to rejoin the case. In the film, they leave this out, but they keep the boy who says, Jouer avec moi, except he says it to Poirot. What kid would look at Poirot and want him to play with them? I like how the film gets across the perspective that Charles is an actor playing roles. Yes, I always start with the feet. Come on. With the shoes. And the costume. And before you know it, you've got a character. Ah, we take It appears to me that the doctor, he was making an experiment. He must have thought that one of the people in Congo was responsible for the crime. Whoa, wait. Poirot would never have jumped to that conclusion. But I guess, with no Satterthwaite, for the sake of the story, he had to. Hmm. The film rearranges the order of events so that Egg joins the team much earlier on, and we see a lot more of each of the suspects. For a movie, this is a good choice, though two changes I wasn't so happy about were having someone tell Poirot that Oliver's accident was staged, instead of him figuring it out, and replacing Robin's death with... Robin fell in love with her too and she sent him to India. He never came back. He did what he wanted! Did he or did you drive him away? Did you drive us all away in the end, Egg? Murder in Three Acts is consistent in being inconsistent, alternating between entertaining and cringe. The order of events is again rearranged, some even overlap each other. They spend a lot of time focusing on the secret passage in Strange's house instead of the suspects and motives. The poison is changed from nicotine to benzatine, probably because nicotine was a lot harder to get hold of in its alkaloid form in the 1980s. Or maybe the film was sponsored by Marlboro, I really don't know. Mrs. Dacres' motive for killing the doctor is left out, as well as the evidence that the butler was a blackmailer. As for the central characters, we don't get a sense that Charles is an actor playing roles. In fact, apart from that one weird line earlier, he comes across as pretty two-dimensional. Egg, likewise, has had her depth removed, even though she's just as impulsive as before. Poirot, once again, is never absent from the case, but thankfully in this version he's less prone to take people's theories at face value. Hastings is still annoying. What are you writing? There's nothing to write about. This is so stupid. Three-Act Tragedy is one of the few Agatha Christie stories where British and American editions differ drastically from each other. In both versions, Charles reveals to Egg that Cartwright is his stage name. His real name is Charles Mugg. Egg repeats this to Poirot, and in the same scene mentions a dress rehearsal. Suddenly, Poirot figures it all out. 
Now, in the American version, the one I read first, there's an earlier scene, which is absent from the British version, where the investigators read a line in Doctor Strange's diary, "Am worried about M. This could refer to Oliver Manders, Muriel Wills, Lady Mary, or Charles Mugg. Charles wanted to marry Egg. He wasn't fooled into thinking she was interested in Oliver. He knew perfectly well she was into him, but had to pretend not to know because Dr. Strange was aware of something that would prevent him from marrying her. And this is where the two editions differ most. In the American version, the secret is that Charles is clinically insane. In the British version, it's that Charles is already married to a woman who's been institutionalized and therefore can't legally be divorced. Personally, I prefer the British version. Charles made a bet with Strange that he could fool people into believing he was his butler. Yes, my friends, at last we have the one and only Christie where the butler did it. Sort of. That's why, when Satterthwaite showed interest in the joke Strange made to the butler, Charles redirected the attention to the phone message and to Rushbridger. Everything Charles did was to create dramatic red herrings, having the same seven guests, the suspicious circumstances incriminating Oliver, the telegram Rushbridger sent to Poirot, even though she couldn't possibly know who Poirot was, and her murder. Was she killed to prevent a teller knows what she knew, eh, Poirot? Or what she did not know, Superintendent? Miss Wills had figured out that Charles was Ellis, but she wasn't sure he was the murderer. Poirot saved her from becoming a fourth murder victim. That's why she disappeared. But why did Charles murder Babington? Well, as Poirot finally realized, that murder was a dress rehearsal, something he'd never encountered before. As an actor, Charles needed to rehearse his murder before actually committing it. He put the poison into a glass, and the victim was random. The only people who couldn't have drunk it were Strange, who never drank cocktails, and Egg, whom Charles handed a drink himself. Egg is devastated. Poirot instructs Oliver to take care of her, and hints that in time the two of them will become an item. Satterthwaite is ashamed that he failed to solve this mystery, but Poirot tells him he came close. You could have solved the whole thing, but for your playgoer's reaction to dramatic effect. Both the film adaptations have Poirot present the solution to the whole cast, whereas in the book it was only to Satterthwaite, Egg, and Charles. The Suchet film puts Poirot literally on a stage, which is just a bit on the nose. Expectedly, it uses the British version of the solution, and it's pretty well done. I have almost nothing to complain about here. It's imbued with some personal sentiments. And now my heart, it is breaking. It is you who have broken my heart. It is you who have deceived me! I have mixed feelings about this, but I'll come back to it in a minute. Murder in Three Acts uses the American solution, and although the dialogue changes a bit, they still lean heavily into Charles's insanity. It feels like Tony Curtis was holding back for this movie right up until this point. I may even at times be dangerous, but I am not, I repeat, not crazy. No offense to Martin Shaw, but it's way harder to spot Tony Curtis as the butler. On the downside, the other characters, including Egg, barely react to the big revelation. In fact, despite the fact that it's Charles's motive, they've scarcely touched on his love for her, his desire to marry her. The film ends with the playwright agreeing to write Poirot's memoirs for him, which... I don't care. The David Suchet version is both the better film and adaptation, as it's more accurate to the source material, and it's better made. It might feel bland in some places, but it's much more likely to age well. However, removing Mr. Satterthwaite changes the story at its core. With him, three-act tragedy is the story of a murderer who would have gotten away with it if Poirot hadn't changed his mind and come back to help with the case. Of the two friends who begin the investigation, one turns out to be the villain leading the other down the garden path. But without Satterthwaite, it's the sad story of Poirot and his friend investigating a murder, and his friend turning out to be the killer which has been done before. It could be looked at as more dramatic, but it necessitates swallowing the idea that it was Poirot who was led down the garden path. And that's why I have mixed feelings about it. 
In adapting this story to screen, I can see why they left out Mr. Satterthwaite, as his role in the book was, by necessity, someone audiences were already familiar with, and modern audiences would have no idea who he is. But in that case, I think it would have been a good idea to adapt this story sooner, before David Suchet's co-stars left the show, because there's one character who would fill Satterthwaite's shoes pretty well, and that's Captain Haste. No, not that one. Well, thank you for joining me. If they ever find a copy of The Passing of Mr. Quinn, I'll be sure to cover it. In the meantime, there are some newer Agatha Christie adaptations I haven't seen yet. Maybe it's time I gave them a try. See? I'm Ricardo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <laughs>